The Edit, brought to you by Glamdahl, bringing Hollywood home. Hello and welcome to The Edit with me, Lisa Cannon. Each week we'll be coming to you here from our cosy Glamdahl Studios, which brings Hollywood home. We're kicking off this brand new series with all things film, fashion and entertainment. In this week's show, I'll be chatting exclusively to the BAFTA and IFTA award-winning Derry Girl star, Saoirse Monica Jackson, who told me about her nerdy love for all things Harry Potter and about sharing scenes with Hagrid himself, Robbie Coltrane. And of course, all I could hear in my head was, you're a wizard, Harry, just over and over again. <laughs> I was like, don't say it, don't say yeah. it, don't say it, don't say it. Plus, we'll be taking a look at some new movies with our resident film critic, Gordon Hayden. But first, with a vast career spanning 30 years, the Pogue's iconic frontman, Shane McGowan, has a story that needs to be told. With Johnny Depp as narrator and Julian Temple as director, we're given unseen archival footage of McGowan's life in this new rockumentary, Crock of Gold. She might write music. A good musician has to put music before everything. And that's what I've always done. Good look down on this little cottage in Ireland and said, that little boy there. He's the little boy that I'm going to use to save Irish music. Shay went to London when we were 13. I love the drinks, the gigs, the girls. The lyrics are always about fighting, drinking, dying, living. You know, the things that everybody does. Oh, where we were the hottest live band in London. Shane McGowan, the visionary, one of the finest writers of the century. Then they went on a world tour. It was nice to big choice. And then things went wrong. Horribly wrong. He went away. You up? And he didn't come back. Not the Shane that I ever knew. And then doctors told me that he had six months to live. If I really wanted to die, I'd be dead already. Well, I'm delighted to announce the special Lifetime Achievement Award to Shane McGowan. We're songs broadened our sense of ourselves. Redemption, sorrow, the ordinary person's story. You were pretty queen of New York. Are you content with what you've achieved? No, I wanted to more. The boys of the envelope, the mini choir, were singing, go away, play. And the bells are ringing out for Christmas Day. Actually, we're better when we're sober, but it's not as much fun, so we get drunk. That looks really good. And joining me now on the sofa is our resident film critic, Gordon Hayden. Gordon, you're very welcome to the edit. Thanks, now, I love the Pogues. I've seen them in concert 10, at least 11 times, if not more. Um, but this actually looks like a decent documentary. It really does. And it's the calibre behind the camera, Lisa. Um, Julian Temple is one of those really celebrated music documentary filmmakers. Um, his, his work over the years, with the likes of The Sex Pistols, The Filth and the Fury. If you've never seen that documentary, I would highly recommend it. It's brilliant. It's brilliant like he, yeah. Just even the just to go off on a slight tangent, just the way in which he shot that film, like each member, the surviving member of the Sex Pistols, they're all <laughs> shot in silhouette, which kind of gives them almost a timeless quality. It's such an unusual choice, but then he is a bit of an unusual character, mm -hmm. Julian Temple. And so he's the perfect choice for someone like Shane McGowan to tell, bring his story uh, to the big screen. So, Absolutely. you know, you've got that eccentricity behind the camera and uh, also in front of it. And with Shane McGowan, you, you, you do feel there is a trust there with Julian Temple. Hence why there has been so much footage, archival footage that has been given over uh, to the making of this film. And then as an added bonus, you have Johnny Depp as narrator. Brilliant. And for those that don't know, Jeez. Johnny Depp and Shane McGowan are very close friends. And I'll tell you how close they are, that when Shane was getting married, 
Johnny Depp was really keen on wanting to sing at one stage That's at the right. wedding. I think Shane McGowan said no, 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 don't that no no. So um, that, but they get on really yeah. well. So you've got Johnny Depp there too. So yeah, all around it is one of those uh, documentaries that if you are like yourself oh, a big fan, fan of yeah, the yeah, Pogues yeah. and you've been waiting for a really really decent doc on Shane McGowan's life you're going to get it with Julian Temple's latest film. All right, aside from this film being out this weekend, we also have everything happening on streaming and Disney has some really nice offerings. Well, you'll remember Mulan was supposed to be getting a, a cinematic release this year, but of course with the global pandemic that wasn't meant to mm -hmm. be. And so Disney tried something with their premium uh, VOD um, service. And now you're going to get to see Mulan um, added to the catalogue of films. So you don't have to pay uh, the premium rate. So if you're a Disney Plus subscriber, you're now going to get to see Mulan. So yeah, it's, it's another live action adaptation because Disney have been churning these out, being part of their business model over the years. Well, I've never seen the actual animation, so I'm actually going to check this one out. Ah, it's a, well, essentially the plot is um, a young girl takes her father's place because um, her father has been, there's, there's conscription has, has kicked in and her father has to rejoin the army, but he's a very elderly man, he can barely walk, so she takes his place. And so she wants to prove herself. So she ends up essentially uh, pretending that she's this boy. Oh. And, I've, you know, I, I won't get into it, but it, it's, it is a fantastic, fantastic story. If truth be told, I prefer the animation over the live action. It tends to happen kind of a lot yeah, with the Disney, the Disney Plus stuff. I'm kind of watching the live action stuff and I'm going, I'd rather be watching the animated version. Now, mind you, on a completely separate note, but one live action film I am looking forward to seeing is Disney's adaptation of Pinocchio when it does go into production Aww. because Tom Hanks is going to play Geppetto. Really? Which I think would be perfect piece of casting. But that's a side. <laughs> That's a size. We'll wait for that one. Yeah. We'll and also, that. I would just recommend as well, if you haven't watched it yet, is, is uh, The Mandalorian. No, I haven't uh, seen this. Everyone's raving about it. Uh, well, look, you know what? I think a lot of Star Wars fans have felt a little bit like, <sighs> bit very divided at the moment, the Star Wars community, because the recent sequel trilogy has been a bit, well, it's been, it hasn't been great. But, but The Mandalorian has been made by people who get the original trilogy, John Favreau and Dave Filoni. They just get it. So if you're a fan of the original trilogy and you haven't seen The Mandalorian, crawl out from that, that rock wherever you are and get on <laughs> Disney Plus because it's well worth a watch. Thanks very much, Gordon. It's always great to see you and we'll see you back here on the sofa next week. Now to whet your appetite for Mulan, which is released on Disney Plus. Let's take a behind the scenes look at the making of this live action film. Every family must contribute one man to fight. <laughs> the world of Mulan is so rich. The costumes, the colours, the real landscapes. And we've assembled the most extraordinary cast for this movie. Led by Liu Yifei. Nobody else could have played the role of Mulan. She's a brilliant actress. But that was only one part of the equation. We put her through a gruelling physical assessment. She's an accomplished martial artist. Every moment Yifei was on set, she raised the bar and she inspired all of us. <laughs> One of my favourite moments was shooting Johnny Yen's martial arts skills. As Commander Tung, he does a sword display in front of all of the recruits. The way he moves a sword, it moves so fast. I had to shoot the sequence again in slow motion just so I could see what he was doing. He is astonishing. This is a big vision of a big journey. And I'm so happy that we've been able to deliver an epic vision of Mulan's story. I will bring honor to us all. It looks great. Now, let's hear from one of Northern Ireland's finest young actors, Saoirse Monica Jackson. She starred as Erin Quinn in the BAFTA-nominated and IFTA-winning TV series Derry Girls, which is currently on Netflix. And she has just completed a brand new series, Urban Myths, with the great Robbie Coltrane. I caught up with her in London earlier in the week over Zoom to chat about life in lockdown and Derry Girls, series three. I know how much you were looking forward to seeing this and that. Take that. But there'll be other concerts. No, there won't. 
The fact that this one's happening is a miracle. Nobody good ever comes here because we keep killing each other. And now we're over on we polar bears. Where will it end? Seriously? Saoirse, happy Christmas. And hello in London. How are you keeping? I'm good, I'm good. Happy Christmas to you. I love being festive, so I'm delighted you're bringing the Christmas vibes now. I listen, I'm full of the red, full of the cheer. I, you're the first person I've wished Happy Christmas to because we've started already. The trees are up in your house, which I know you showed me in London. I've yet to do it. I think this is actually the earliest I've ever had my Christmas decorations up because you just want to bring <laughs> some sort of joy. Like, And I think it's desperate that there's so much, um, we're, was- we're wishing so much time away at the moment, aren't we? Which is actually quite yeah, sad. Right. And you have to sort of stop yourself from doing that. So instead of wishing the time away, I'm just getting the, getting the festive spirit and faster. Good woman yourself. <laughs> now you're not at home in Derry, but your family are actually in London. So obviously that's where all the work is. But the acting community has taken such a punch over the last couple of months. Obviously all the arts, Broadway is closed, Shaftesbury Avenue in London, everything is shut down, grinded to a halt. So what has the vibe and the atmosphere been like for the community that you love and know so well? You know, at the start of lockdown, and maybe the people might massively disagree with this, there was something quite nice as an actor at the start that we were all in the same position because it's so hard not to get caught up all the time with what everybody else is doing, especially when you're not working um, and having your ear to the ground of hearing what, what work is coming in. And um, you can't help but sometimes being like, why am I not being seen for every single part? So there was yeah. something that I think I live in a house with so like, with um, a bunch of actors. And we definitely found that there was some solace in that at the start, that we were all on the one boat and everybody was sort of taking that time to step back and reassess. Obviously, I don't think we could have predicted that we would still sort of be in this position now, um, no. this long afterwards, and the sort of gloom and misery of the theatre still being shut and the worry about how how that's going to be when we eventually come out the other end of this with the vaccine. But I think that in a strange way, definitely for me, and maybe that's been harder for other people, it's sort of brought us together in a way. and. Um, it's definitely gave me the moment to sort of stand back and reflect on the work that I actually do want to do or the people that I would really, really like to work with. It's given me the time to read the books that I've wanted to read for so long. Good. Just sort of Good. Under that. So yeah, you find the you find the silver lining, don't you? So You do indeed. And of course, as you just said there, you're living with a whole host of actors. So I can only imagine the games that go on at nighttime after a few glasses of wine, human pyramid, twister, you name it. I say you have great track over there. You're only 26 years old, Saoirse, and the cash of, of work that you have delivered over the last couple of years has been astounding. I mean, people don't really know, but you've treaded the boards, you've done, you know, incredible series for the BBC and other, and worked in Derry on, on other plays. But of course, you're most famous for your role as Erin in Derry Girls. Jesus. Mommy, well, maybe can we cut by? Not the Christmas cupboard. They've had the very tonics, Mary. Animals, a lot of you. We needed energy for our poetry. I give you energy for your poetry. We were just going to take a handful of chocolate money, Mary, but then one thing led to another. What am I supposed to do? I'll have to start from scratch now. And December's only round the corner. It's eight months away, love. Whether you watch it on Netflix or you caught it on Channel 4, it is the funniest show on television. It, it's becoming, quite quickly, a classic for everyone. <laughs> oh, thank you. I definitely can't take credit for any of that. And that's down to Lisa, <laughs> our writer. But yeah, definitely to date, that's been my favourite role I've played. And getting back to do the audio, getting back to Erin, um, actually just this month and recording the audiobook that um, the Erin's diary that Lisa's written, which is fantastic. There, I had so much fun just doing Erin again. Um, it was a real, it was a real, real joy to sort of get back under those shoes again. And it was mad when I was going to do the audiobook. I was sort of apprehensive in a way, thinking, "Oh my God, it's going to be so strange to be Erin without um, Orla, Michelle, and Claire and James." But yeah. There's something mad about the way Erin um, works as a character. She sort of can convince herself and they one thing and by the end of the train of thought, she's already disagreed with herself. Um, 
So the the audiobook really lent itself to that character and and that humor. All of the characters were very unique in their own way, but I have to say my favorite was Sister uh, Sister Michael. She was just unbelievable, and Tommy Tiernan's character really really funny. Like I I, I was literally falling yeah. off my sofa with laughter. You must have had great fun on set, like really good times with them as well, with two stand up comedians there as well on board. Yeah, I was definitely starstruck in the first season, the first time round working with Tommy, and you know it's quite remarkable. I think that's definitely on Lisa's writing. Um, I always say that it's like all the characters sort of serve a different version of Irish humour. Um, yeah. Whether it's Siobhan being really dry and deadpan, to Tommy's like nervousness, <laughs> to Michelle's like really cotton um, sort of lines, we sort of all serve up a different version of Irish humour. So it's really long. It's really long days. It's really hard not to be killing yourself laughing um, during every <laughs> take. So it's mad. And there, there's this like old rumour, this like old folk tale. If you're laughing on set, people won't be laughing at home. So when we were filming yeah. the first series, right. we were like, oh my God, we're screwed. We're screwed because we're finding each other <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, you came back with series two, bigger, bat, bolder, more bolshy than ever. And it was just brilliant. You knocked it out of the ballpark because I suppose even as a viewer, we were a little nervous. Is it going to deliver? And by golly, did it. I mean, I suppose it begs the question, you know what I'm going to ask you, Saoirse? What's happening? Is series three on the way? <laughs> This series Come on. Three is on the way. Lisa's um, finished it, and I think she actually well, she'd finished it quite a long time ago, and then during the lockdown, she's I think used that time to make the scripts even better, and um, she's not failed again. It's it's even more of a step up from season two, and we've had um, chats on the phone um, about what's what's next to happen for all of our characters. Obviously, I'm sworn to secrecy. So I won't be able to tell you any of that. I know, I know. <laughs> but I know that you've spoken to me even before we kick started the interview. You said like that so much of your work has been pushed now to 2021. Projects, adverts, theatre. I mean, that must be quite difficult as well because you're so well known for Derry Girls. So obviously you're spotted on the streets. Everybody wants to know when the next series is. And you're like, yeah, guys, it's on the way. But we have to wait quite a bit now because of lockdown. Am I right? Yeah. And I think, you know, this sounds quite strange, but a lot of productions now that are going ahead, there there are difficulties and um, we're all just trying to do the best we can to get the job yeah. done. But some shows are more difficult to film than others. And I think the nature of Jerry Gaines, the fact that there's 10 people talking in each shot just makes it even more difficult. So unfortunately, yeah. we're, it's not one of the shows that... Um, could really be made with the restrictions now that are in place with filming. So we're just waiting for there to be the time where we can film it safely and so that Hopefully. we're not delivering a diluted version of our show because mm -hmm. that's the last thing we want. We don't want people oh, no. looking back yeah. on it in years to come going, oh, it wasn't quite the same as the first or the second. So you of want course. it to be in full Jerry Gears madness with about 90 million people talking at once. <laughs> well, we're we're literally, we're literally itching for the next series. We're all ready for it. Oh. I mean, you've got, you've had such a massive trajectory of your career, you know, starting, as I said, in theatre and then with Dairy Girls, which is, you know, had 2018 when we first saw it, it first aired then, Series 2, 2019, and we'll get, of course, Series 3 in 2021, please God. And I'm so pleased that you have a brand new series out on Sky Arts as well with the very brilliant Robbie Coltrane, Urban Myth. Wow, tell us about this. Oh, it was brilliant. It was such a lovely experience filming the job. So um, our story is the the story of Orson Welles coming to Norfolk, which did actually happen. And then we just stretched the truth a little bit because never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, exactly. But imagine, you, I would imagine, you know, filming with Robbie Coltrane, you've got to be a Harry Potter fan. Everybody is. We all grew up with it. Hagrid standing there in front of you, doing all these scenes as Janice the journalist. Uh, what was that yeah. like? And of course, all I could hear in my head was, you're a wizard, Harry, just over and over again. <laughs> and I was like, don't say it, don't say yeah. it, don't say it, don't say it. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. I've been a huge fan of Rabbi for years. And that, 
I, obviously, we all love Harry Potter, and Harry Potter is fantastic. But his other stuff, Harry, um, Robbie would has been really well known for his improv. He used to have an improv sketch show years ago that I'd like watched on the internet. I don't know how I came across it, like on this YouTube poll, and I'd watch clips of it, and I just thought, oh my god, you're amazing, and Cracker and things like that. And I just actually do think he's one of the best character actors that we have, and yeah. Him, um, himself a national treasure and all these things. So to be working alongside him was a real dr dream come true. And it was like life and um, imitating art because Janet and the show was trying to play it cool, but she's working alongside him and actually she's really overwhelmed and petrified. And that's sort of what <laughs> I felt like when I was working with them. But it was it was amazing. I never thought I was going to get to boss Robbie Coltrane around and I did, wow. so it was fantastic. And again, well, listen, some Cracker 60s costumes. <laughs> I know, <laughs> yeah, and you look way. absolutely spot on in that as well. And it's a nice departure, of course, seeing you in your school uniform to something from the 1960s. But I'm sure you love playing dress up. I mean, that's all part of the fun as well, yeah, right? Exactly. My mom actually told me when I was younger, I said I wanted to be an actress. And she said, you get to keep all the clothes. Which was a lie, <laughs> but it is fun dressing up. <laughs> that's, that's a total lie. Like, where did your mum pick that one up? That's a total lie, total <laughs> lie. Um, but listen, Deirdre, it's been so lovely talking to you from your home in London. And uh, I wish you a very Merry Christmas. And I know everyone's going to want to catch you, of course, in season three of Derry Girls, if and when that's coming out next year. But more importantly, to see you at work with Robbie Coltrane and Urban Myth, which is on Sky Arts at the moment. Thank you so much for your time, Thank Sirta. you. It was lovely talking to you, Lisa. Thank you. And you can catch Sirsha in her new series, Urban Myths, currently showing on Sky Arts. Don't forget to like and subscribe to The Edit. You can catch the show every week on the styledit.com and lisacannon.ie. Coming up on next week's show, we'll be chatting to Emmy-nominated casting director Louise Kiley, the woman responsible for the stratospheric fame of Paul Meskel from BBC's Normal People. We'll be also checking out Dreamland, the Margot Robbie film, plus Pixie, the latest Irish offering from Colin Meaney and Alec Baldwin. So from me, Lisa Cannon, and all of us here on The Edit in Glamdoll Studios, we'll catch you again next week. Take care. Edit, brought to you by Glamdoll, bringing Hollywood home.